slippery. But... Frustrated. Frustrated is a good word for it. Grin and bear it, I guess. Last week, we got the right hook. This week, the left. Winter strikes again, this time with an onslaught of rain and ice, closing schools, snarling traffic, and canceling flights. We've had the big snowstorm followed by sub-zero temperatures and today's freezing rain and ice pellets for students in Peel and Halton to stay home. It's the third time in the last two weeks that the school board has canceled classes because of the weather. Greg Ross is in Mississauga for us tonight. And Greg, no school, no problem for students, but parents are having a hard time with these snow days. Yeah, especially parents with younger children because they have very few options. They either have to, at the last minute, try and find some uh, daycare for their children or they have to take the day off work themselves to stay home with their kids. And if you look at the highway here behind me, it looks like many parents went with option B and stayed home with their kids. This is the QEW coming out of Toronto, and you can see not a lot of headlights coming towards us here. That's because it's a clear indication that these parents decided to stay home and wait it out with their kids. Snow, ice pellets, and freezing rain, a perfect recipe for treacherous road conditions. It was also enough for the Peel District School Board to close their schools today. We, we don't want our students and our staff uh, lives put at risk. Great news for many students. For, I'm going to guess that you're pretty happy about getting the day off today. Yeah, I am. But parents like weren't as enthusiastic. It doesn't seem like a regular snow day. It's actually kind of mild out. A lot of our snow melted this week. It's also the third time in the last two weeks that the Peel School Board has called down classes. Each time, many parents with young children were forced to find alternate care for their kids on short notice. I used to live in Quebec, so I'm, I'm used to snowstorms. Jakina Israel battled the weather conditions to get to work in downtown Toronto. I have a brother who lives with me. He's in grade nine, so he's 14. Um, his school is, I'd, I'd say, 10, 10 minutes, five, five, 10 minutes for a drive, maybe like a 20 minute walk. So he could go to school. I think they should go to school because last week uh, schools were closed for two or three days, I believe. So it's just, you know, they, they need they need to go to school. They need to learn. When we're adults, you know, they don't cancel work. The school board says it's not a decision they take lightly. So we understand it's frustrating. We ask parents to, to keep in mind that our, our top priority is to ensure the safety of staff and students, and that's, that's the step we've taken today. And there's a lot of dangerous drivers out there, and it is slippery conditions. So I'd rather them be home and safe than worry about them traveling back and forth on the school bus. While most students haven't been missing class during these snow days, we did find one who was upset they were canceled. Why did you want to go to school so bad? Because we have ukulele today. Yeah, so she was a little disappointed about missing that class, but uh, not many students were on her side today, obviously. Happy to take another day off school. But this is one indication where maybe uh, they jumped the gun just a little bit here. Last week, definitely, we had some really bad conditions. Uh, I think uh, in this case, its bark was worse than its bite because uh, these conditions don't seem as bad as uh, we thought they were going to be. But I did reach out to some other school boards in the GTA, the uh, Toronto District School Board. They had classes open today. They did cancel uh, their bus service. Uh, and other district uh, school boards, uh, including York and Durham, had schools open today as well, Dwight. So uh, they weren't buying it when it came to this weather forecast. Not even a good day to go tobogganing. Thank you for that, Greg. And it's not just drivers and transit riders feeling the sting of some of that falling ice out there. Many people hoping to catch a flight today may have been disappointed as delays and cancellations due to the weather plagued both Pearson and Billy Bishop. Just a few minutes ago, Pearson was showing a 26% of all arriving flights cancelled. And of the flights departing from the airport, 29% have been cancelled. And the question for you, Nick, is that... Did, is there any kind of precipitation we didn't see today? We had nah. snow, we had rain, we had ice pellets, we had sleet. And, and by yes. tomorrow, okay. we might actually see a thunderstorm as well. Wow. We give <laughs> a uncle. Yeah, it's, it's like four seasons in, in 24 hours. Um, so most of the freezing rain has now passed off, but we are under a freezing drizzle advisory. And the reason for this is tonight and tomorrow, we're still looking at the risk for some patchy freezing drizzle. So freezing drizzle advisories across the region. That'll make for some icy road conditions for tomorrow morning's commute as well. And then into the afternoon, by the later afternoon, the evening commute, things are going to turn over to rainfall as temperatures climb. Right now, as I mentioned, 
send most of the stuff out to the south of us, and that's why we've dropped the freezing rain warnings. However, another system moving in from behind is going to bring with it some more patchy freezing drizzle. And you see these little lightning bolts there? That's thunderstorm activity, and that's why we're forecasting the risk for some thunderstorms tomorrow evening. We're sitting at minus 2 degrees right now in the Golden Horseshoe uh, 0, about the highest down in the St. Catharines area. We're just on the uh, edge of the warm front, and that's why we've been seeing this freezing rain and freezing drizzle through the day today. Minus 3 tonight, the risk for a little bit of patchy freezing drizzle, also some mist and fog in the area. By tomorrow morning, though, look for freezing drizzle and freezing rain until the afternoon as temperatures climb. We'll time it out for you and talk about a very short warm-up coming up in just a bit. Dwight. We have lots to talk about. We'll check back with you. Yeah, we certainly do. Hey, bye. Thank you, buddy. The PC government is overhauling the way autism treatment services are offered in Ontario, and the plan is to clear a wait list of thousands within 18 months. We have 23,000 children today in Ontario that are languishing on a wait list, that have no hope, their parents are frustrated, I cannot, in good conscience, as the minister responsible for children and youth, allow the Liberal program to continue. It's unfair, it's inequitable, and it's unsustainable. This is the best approach, and it's the most fair approach, to ensure that every single child in Ontario with autism is protected and has a fighting chance to succeed. The investment in early diagnostic centres will be doubled and money will be offered directly to families. Macau says this will be on a sliding scale. For instance, a child entering the program at age two would be eligible to receive up to $140,000 for treatment, while a child entering the program at age seven would receive up to $55,000. Now, that funding would cover treatment until the age of 18. Today's announcement is being met with some criticism, including from inside the PC party. Joining us now is Bruce McIntosh. Bruce, you're a past president of the Ontario Autism Coalition. Yes. You're also the legislative assistant to PC MPP, Amy Fee, which made the announcement with Lisa McLeod today. But right after that, you resigned from that job. Why? That's right. Well, the, the decisions that the government have made to make changes to the OAP are absolutely wrongheaded. Um, it's the, um, the new funding uh, situation doesn't recognize the differences in needs okay. between children at the high needs end of the spectrum and at the lower needs end of the spectrum. And as a result, no child is going to be getting the right amount of money for, well, <laughs> what they need. So Minister McLeod said the program overhaul will mean less kids on wait lists. Now, that sounds like good news because we've had this massive wait list that we were trying to get rid of. Well, it sounds good, mm -hmm. but um, cast your mind back about three years when the Wynn government wanted to kick about a third of the children off the wait list. And we remember that. $8,000. Yes. Today, Minister McLeod would like to get all of the children off the wait list and give them $20,000 a year. And that is nothing like adequate for the needs of, of the, uh, the moderate to severe kids. It's just nowhere close. You're a father. Yes. Two children with autism, what would you like to see the province do on this file? First of all, needs-based funding. I mean, it's, it's absolutely critical. Um, but the, there, are, there was a roadmap left before the election. I sat on an advisory committee that mm -hmm. told the Liberals, you know, what ought to be done. And there were things that were left unfinished. Some of the accountability uh, things that should have been done. Um, this government has been complaining about um, overly large uh, behavior plans. Well, there, there wasn't a process in, in place yet to give those behavior plans a double check to make sure that, you know, the, the, they were justified. Um, so th there are other measures that could be taken to make the existing program work better. Um, this minister has, has talked about working toward, um, you know, services in schools. Okay. Well, I heard Belton McGinty say that more than 15 years ago, so... Now, the um, minister also said, though, that she consulted with parents, so did she listen to the parents like yourselves, then? Is that what you're saying? That did not happen. Well, I, th I think she, she did listen to them. I mean, there's, there's dissatisfaction with the length of time that is being spent on the wait lists. Okay. But one of, the, one of the things I find difficult to explain to some of the, the newer parents in the, the autism world, my son spent four and a half years on the wait list. We have parents today complaining about spending one and a half to two years on the wait list. Not that that's 
you know, it, it's still too long, it's not perfect, but no. it's considerably better. The direction that things were going in was making steady improvement, but now that's all been thrown away for something that's not going to work and isn't equitable. It's equal, but it's not equitable. And you're so upset about it, you're actually leaving this government. Oh, I can't defend government. the indefensible. It's, it's indefensible. Okay. I'm not going to stay there and try and tell you that it's okay. Appreciate your time. Good luck with this. You're welcome. Thanks for this. So what does the government have to say about the criticism surrounding that $140,000 cap? Power and Politics host Bashi Capellas asked that of Minister McLeod earlier. Take a listen to her answer. If you cap funding at $140,000 for a child in treatment from the ages of 2 to 18, intensive therapy for a high-needs kid can cost between sixty dollars and $80,000 a year. So that would only pay for two years of treatment for someone with high needs. Well, no, because the, there, there will be an annualized am amount of money that families will be able to receive up until $140,000 to the age of 18. You said annualized. I, I, I understood it to be $140,000 total. No, it's $140,000 between the age of 0 to 18. We've brought in Autism Ontario to help uh, navigate that system for families. But if it costs you $70,000 a year to be treated at the high end of the spectrum, how, and you're 2 or 3 well, years old, how will you sustain that until you're 18? Well, the reality is it's, it's either allow this program to exist for 25% of the kids or do what I want, ensuring that all 100% of the kids in the, it, that need support get the support. And unfortunately, that means tough choices, uh, it, and that means that we have to... Uh, we, we increased the budget from the Liberal budget of they were at 256 million. I'm at 321 million, but we're going to we're going to continue to provide supports for all of those children. It's not fair to take funds away from kids that are already in therapy, where they're making gains and have already waited for years. Coming up more on today's changes to Ontario's autism programs, or this mother says her child's development is now in jeopardy. That's coming up at 6.30. We're getting a clearer picture tonight of the damage caused at a Ronsonsville's daycare on Monday around one in the afternoon. Part of the roof caved in while the children were inside. Chris Glover joins us with more on this now. And Chris, you spoke to the family of a child who was hurt in that. Yeah, and a lot of families obviously would be very fearful of this situation. It has to be one of the worst fears for a parent, their kid being injured while well, they're not even there to protect them. Well, Monday, authorities told us three children suffered minor injuries at that West End daycare when part of the facility's ceiling fell onto them. And today, we can show you what those injuries looked like for at least one of the children. During the day, two-and-a-half-year-old Isla Hesh is generally still happy and playing. Scratched her face fairly badly, swollen eye. Like it's just sort of starting to open up again now. But at night, she's having trouble sleeping. She's been having nightmares at night as well. Like, at night, she has, like, the first night after it happened, she was talking about, you know, parts falling. It's because Monday, while she slept, parts of a ceiling fell on her face. It happened inside this Roncesville daycare during nap time. Monday, police said two girls and a boy suffered minor injuries from a partial roof collapse. She has like a, a few scratches, but nothing major. It could have been a lot worse. Parents and the media were told none of the kids were hurt seriously enough to go to hospital. But Isla's parents got a different call. It's pretty upsetting to hear that, you know, our daughter was taken to the hospital immediately from the daycare. Isla's parents found her at St. Joseph's Hospital. And she's covered in, you know, rubble and blood and dust and pretty upset. They were shocked to see the extent of their daughter's injuries. It's a mixture of being thankful that nothing worse happened, but still being horrified that, you know, she is injured and you don't know how injured at that time, right? The two and a half year old didn't need stitches and is taking Advil for pain. But I think she's overall been fairly brave through it all. Like she's, she's doing well. But her parents are now speaking out to set the record straight. Uh, I think it's fair for the other parents to know what has happened. If they do know, then they can make an appropriate choice for themselves as to what to do next. I'm upset at perhaps the not being entirely truthful. Since it happened, her parents have taken her out of that daycare, and the family um, says that they found alternative arrangements for her. Now, I emailed and called the daycare, but I haven't received a response yet, Dwight. What have we learned, uh, though, Chris, about why it, this happened in the first place? I mean, th that little girl looked like she could have lost an eye. 
Yeah, she's very, very lucky, as well as the other children. Uh, authorities said on that day that snow buildup on the roof could have been a potential cause here, but that work is still ongoing. And as for the building itself, the daycare first received its permit in 2013, and it passed all building inspections at that time. Now, of course, after the collapse, the city went and inspected the building, and they determined that there was no further immediate risk, but the city is requesting an engineer go and assess the building, and once that assessment is done, then they will decide if further action needs to be taken. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. We have an update now on a fire that heavily damaged the Scarborough Recreation Center last week. The fire marshal telling CBC News today the fire appears to have been accidental and may have been caused by an electrical short. The blaze broke out last Thursday at the Asian Court Recreation Center. It wasn't until Saturday it was fully extinguished. Luckily, no one was injured. There was extensive damage, though, to the building. The rec center is one of Scarborough's busiest with almost 3,000 registrations for its winter sessions. And the four alarm blaze ripped through a commercial building in the heart of Chinatown today. Crews were called to Spadina near Dundas around 10 this morning. At its peak, over 65 firefighters were on scene with 17 trucks. One firefighter was injured. The weather made for tough conditions for the crews. Just the volume of, of ice and sleet and snow on the ground is making it very, very slippery. So that, of course, is coating the rungs on the aerial ladders and ground ladders and all that type of thing. So uh, it's another tough weather day for our crews, for sure. The blaze is now under control and the scene is cleared. The cause, though, is still under investigation. It's been a rough few months for hundreds of residents of some of St. Jamestown's apartment complex. One building had a fire, another a burst pipe, and in both cases, it meant shutting down the power. Well, tonight, electricity is out at another building. Alicia Hassan is live at 280 Wellesley. And Ali, at least this time, residents knew this was coming. That's right. People here were given two days' notice that the power was going to be shut off. And, Dwight, for a lot of the people that we spoke with today, they said they're okay with that because it's a preventative measure to make sure nothing bad happens here. There's no heat, uh, can't cook. Another day, another supply table set up at a St. Jamestown apartment building. No water, no power. The day before yesterday, we got a notice. So immediately we planned, tried to book a hotel, uh, but it was too costly. Uh, because he, for him, the food is necessary, so if I need to cook anything, it will be very difficult. I have a disabled daughter in a wheelchair that pretty much is stranded up there uh, while the elevators are out. Well, they're inspecting the equipment, which is a good thing. Unlike their neighbors in the same block, at 650 Parliament, where a fire broke out this summer, and the burst pipe situation last month next door, 280 Wellesley went dark today on purpose for a safety inspection. We received a uh, electrical order through the Toronto Fire Monday afternoon. The power will be shut down for 12 hours, allowing electricians to do a full inspection. At the same time, there's some cleaning of circuits and things like that that's going on. Uh, if there's no uh, issues found, and we are suspecting right now, and everything so far is suggesting that there hasn't been any issues found, uh, ESA would then have to give us approval to repower the building. It's the city's proactive move, prompted by what happened at the other buildings managed by Wellesley Parliament Square. This is a community that has suffered. Uh, Tremendously over the last few months, there have been just uh, far too many coincidences and far too many challenges for one community to bear. As we've seen before, these buildings can get pretty dark when the power is out. So we've seen people carrying flashlights up with them to their unit. Some people chose to stick it out. Others have found somewhere else to stay. A temporary setback, temporary inconvenience, but ultimately it's better than having us all move out because of an electrical fire. So. We make do with what we have and we'll get through it. You can see some backup lighting has been set up in the lobby here where people will be congregating tonight. Uh, the power is supposed to be out for a minimum of 12 hours, so that takes us to 8 p.m. tonight. Uh, but a lot of the people that we spoke with today said they're prepared to go without power for 
24 hours given the track record of these buildings. And that is not lost on the city. They said they are concerned over the electrical systems of these buildings, not just this one and the one around the corner, but all of the buildings that are managed by the same company and uh, the same owners. And we do know that there is at least one more here in St. Jamestown. Send yeah. it back to you, Dwight. It's one of the most densely populated spots in the city. They need to check on that. Thank you for that, Ali. Coming up, I sit down with the man dubbed a great uniter, former Ontario Chief Justice Roy McMurtry. But not all saw him that way after the break, why he got a threatening letter from the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. If you persist in your treacherous activities against the white race, I can only assure you that there can be only grave consequences. The weather update is brought to you by Train Extreme Conditions Testing. It's hard to stop a train, really hard. Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. They live in the shadow of a much larger condo tower, but it's not shade that's being thrown. It's garbage landing on their balconies during vomit. Now they're fed up. Coming up, the disappointing answer residents are getting from the city. During construction, a hammer fell right through a skylight and ended up on somebody's desk. Uh, honestly, when I'm out here, I look up and I think, oh my God, you know, something's going to come down. 
Or McMurtry spent his career taking on diverse issues and causes, but it was his anti-discrimination and social justice, justice work that got him in trouble with the KKK. The former Ontario judge and attorney general still has the letter, which was personally delivered to him by David Duke more than 40 years ago. I met with McMurtry to talk about why the Grand Wizard sent him a warning. Mr. McMurtry, this letter is in protest against your anti-white policies, which have been in direct opposition to the interests of the white Canadian population. If you persist in your treacherous activities against the white race, I can only assure you that there can be only grave consequences. Signed, David Duke, Grand Wizard, Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> Why did the KKK decide to target you and send this letter? You know, we prosecuted some of this Western Guard group for their racial violence, and, and several of these people were put in jail. And that's what, I, what sparked David Duke's protest much to my pleasure. <laughs> Social justice was very important to you. Human yes. rights were very important to you. Yes. Where did that come from? Was that something you got from your parents? Was it something that you just found growing up in, in a multicultural city like Toronto? Well, was Toronto it? wasn't a very multicultural city. Actually, when you city, were growing up now, that, that's my era, up. not your era. Right. You're absolutely right. And what it became, and my uh, Late brother Bill, he and I became quite involved, and, and part of it had to do with the fact that he worked for at least one summer as a sleeping car porter in for the CNR, I think. Which was one of the few bla jobs black men could yes, get at that time. Yes, and he, he met and became friendly with a number of uh, black gentlemen, and, and uh, and so we became very interested in these issues, particularly the race of races issues. I worked for an organization called Frontier College as an undergraduate, where I worked 10 hours a day, six days a week at hard labor on a railway repair gang, and then taught new immigrants at night. And that helped, I think, uh, encourage the uh, respect I had for the people who made the difficult and often courageous decision to leave their countries of birth and, and uh, go to a country with a different culture and, and often a different language. You co-authored a report on the roots of violence involving youth. When you look at the issues from the time that, that you co-authored that report in 08 to now, have we made any progress? Are things getting better, you think? Well, not that much better. I think they're getting a little better. I think there should be far more amenities for young uh, people of color to sort of develop their talents and whatnot. And I think the uh, government should be prepared to invest a lot more uh, resources in, in, in giving young people uh, an opportunity. Why do you think that Governments keep making the same mistakes. I mean, the ordinary person has to be engaged, and we don't have a significant number of the people in this province engaged in these issues. So I think we have to be continually vigilant to promote these issues. Otherwise, uh, our quality of life in this community will deteriorate and our problems will become exacerbated and, and, and more serious. I mean, to me, it's, a, it's an issue which is, you know, I regard as a, probably the most important issue in, in, in the community. Now, Roy McMurtry wasn't afraid of controversy in his career. He also took on violence in hockey and same-sex marriage. Tomorrow, we'll have more of my sit-down with him to talk about his legacy, and his headline-making career. And we have some sad news to report tonight. Former MP Paul Durer has died. Durer was diagnosed last year with glioblastoma, the type of brain cancer that killed the tragically hip Gore Downey, 
Doerr was the NDP MP for Ottawa Centre from 2006 to 2015. Paul Doerr was just 56 years old. 25 years ago, Clinton Gale shot and killed Toronto police officer Todd Bayliss. Now Gale is up for parole. But Bayliss's brother has started a petition calling on officials to deny his release. I, I've known it's been coming. I've been preparing myself for, you know, 20 odd years now that this is coming. There's no goddamn way that he should get out. We'll have that story for you after the break. We can do better, we must do better, and we will do better because children with autism in the province of Ontario deserve better. With 23,000 children on a wait list, big changes are coming to how the province funds autism programs. The PCs say it will clear that backlog in 18 months. Good news for many, but the changes the PCs put forward today aren't being welcomed by all. The new cap on funding is supposed to make the system more equitable for parents and families, but some say it is not enough. Under the old system, a parent who got off the wait list was eligible for indefinite funding until their child turned 18. And now, children diagnosed later in life will get less money than those diagnosed at a younger age. Farmarelli sat down with one mother who is now worried the money will dry up for her son in as little as two years. 
Max, your hat, put your hat away. Where does your hat go? Hi, I'm Maria Garrido, and I have a four-year-old son, Max, who is the love of my life and has autism. Yeah. I want... Ugly. I want... What? Ice cream. Ugly. Very good. I Max was diagnosed uh, just around two and a half years old. It took us uh, three or four months to find a developmental pediatrician who would be comfortable enough in diagnosing Max. Max stopped saying words after 18 months. How long have you been on a wait list for, for treatment? I've been on the wait list for over two years and our regional provider has told us that it'll be more three years. And that just broke my heart. So you listened to the announcement today from Minister McLeod about uh, cutting down these waiting lists, making the system more equitable. Uh, what's your reaction to that? The message that I got from that announcement is that we want to make it equitable for all children to access therapy, but it's not fair to take funds away from kids that are already in therapy where they're making gains and have already waited for years I love you. Love you. I love you. Can you do mwah? Thank you. I'm scared because once Max's name comes up on this list for help, he's gonna get a year or two of the help that he needs. And that's it. Because under this new program, our understanding is that children after five aren't gonna get much. But if I were to pay what I actually do need to do to pay for my son, you're looking at about 5,000 a month. So roughly maybe 60 to 70,000 a year. So how long would this funding, if you were to qualify for $140,000 last for his therapy? Two years. He would get two years of the therapy that he needs. It's atrocious. The government is not listening to the full story. I think they rushed this. Now we have full details about what's changing when it comes to autism programs, wait lists, therapy and funding online. Just head to cbc.ca slash Toronto. Broken skylights, vomit on the patio, and garbage tossed onto their balconies? Downtown condo owners are fed up with their filthy, rowdy neighbours, and CBC Toronto has learned there's very little the city can do about it. Lisa Shing explains why. Pop cans, beer bottles, chicken bones. There are hundreds of items you would normally find in the trash and not here on the roof of a historic building. In construction, a hammer fell right through a skylight and ended up on somebody's desk. The century-old graphic arts building is rich in history. It was home to newspaper-turned-magazine Saturday Night Press. The group of seven artists used the space. It's five stories tall and right next door to this 50-story condo. Residents there seem to be throwing their garbage and more off their balconies. This property manager at Graphic Arts took this video during a cleanup showing dozens of garbage bags, broken skylights, empty booze bottles, even one lodged in the roof. This doesn't seem to be an annoyance issue as much as it is a safety yeah, issue. One, it's a safety issue. The city planner should think of things like that in the future going forward with all the growth downtown because it, it's a liability that he can't enjoy his terrace because people were aiming cigarette butts. On his terrace. That terrace belongs to Richard Blundell, a longtime resident. So here we are, Lisa. Yeah. The problem started a couple of years ago when the building went up next door. When people are having parties, they might actually vomit over the side. So I will have uh, vomit on my terrace. And it's up to you to clean up. It's up to me to clean up. This is, this is an extension of my home. Um, and I want to enjoy this space. But he can't for fear of what will rain down from above. 
any time you're out here, you kind of have to be a little bit yes, vigilant, you right? Yes, you do. I mean, I do look up, uh, honestly. When I'm out here, I look up and I think, oh my God, you know, is something going to come down? Fortunately, nothing has hit me. Several graphic arts residents tried to resolve the problem by going to the city and the building next door, but enforcement is tough. The culprits need to be caught in the act. You can obviously see that when you look up, it's next to impossible for me to identify which unit it, uh, it has come from. I've called the city, I've called buildings, you know, you, you can't get nowhere. Now the building's built, there's really not too much you can do. The city says the issue is considered illegal dumping. The penalty is a $365 fine. You could also sue, but some lawyers say this isn't just a story about bad neighbors. If an object hits and injures someone, it could quickly become criminal. Lisa Sheng, CBC News, Toronto. Remember, if you have a story you would like us to look into, just send us an email, torontotips at cbc.ca. The Toronto Police Sergeant facing misconduct charges in connection with the Bruce MacArthur case is fighting back. Sergeant Paul Gauthier is expected to be charged with insubordination and neglect of duty at a tribunal later this month. This stems from an interaction he had with the serial killer in 2016. A man told police MacArthur had tried to strangle him. MacArthur was then questioned by police and released. In a letter written by Gauthier, he says he was, quote, set up by the force to be their fall guy for all of this simply because they need a scapegoat. A statement from a TPS spoke per spokesperson insisted the misconduct charges stemmed from a standard internal investigation. Leave him in prison because that's what he deserves. His brother was a Toronto police officer shot and killed in the line of duty 25 years ago. Oh, yeah. Now he's trying to keep the killer behind bars. The man who killed Constable Todd Bayliss will soon be eligible for parole, having served his sentence. In order to keep him in prison, Corey Bayliss has started an online petition. And as Kelda Ewan shows us, in just a few days, it has already received thousands of signatures. But you can see the, the height difference. Eh? It's a day Corey Bayliss knew would eventually come. I, I've known it's been coming. I've been preparing myself for, you know, 20 odd years now that this is coming. And, um, I'm ready for it. There's just, there's, there's just no way he should get out. He is Clinton Gale, who in June 1994 fatally shot Corey's brother Todd and wounded his partner. The two Toronto police officers were on foot patrol near Jane and Eglinton when it happened. Gale, a known drug trafficker, was given two life sentences. In May, he will have his first parole hearing after serving 25 years. That's probably about 10 years old now. For Corey, he's now lived without a brother for almost as long as he's had one. It's been a very lonely 25 years for my mom, my dad and I. And I was talking with uh, a girlfriend of mine there a few days ago and, you know, I said to her, you know, we were talking about it and I said, I just, I don't think people care anymore. It's been 25 years. I just don't think they do. And, you know, kind of depressed and, and thinking about it like, Jesus, you know, I got figure out something that that I can do to bring attention to this. So he started this petition to keep Gail behind bars. To his surprise, in less than three days, it has already gotten over 7,000 signatures from across the country. Many friends and family have also changed their social media profile photo to a picture of Todd. I said, Corey, it's the power of social media. Like your voice for Todd has gone so far, you have no idea. Toronto Police Constable Lori McCann is a childhood friend of the Bayless brothers. Yeah, that's the two of them. She remembers June 1994 vividly. So yeah, it was, it was a really tough time. And like many of those who have signed the petition, she thinks Gail should remain in prison. I think life should be life. Hopefully by the time it comes to that point where we go before a, a parole board, I can slap a petition down that has, you know, tens of thousands of signatures on it. But criminal justice lawyer Shane Martinez says it's not likely to drive the decision. Petitions like that may serve a cathartic purpose for the family of a victim. However, it should not be allowed to influence the decision of a board. He also uh, says most first-time parole applicants get denied. And given the severity of Gail's crimes, it's not likely it will be granted to him. Gale was also under a deportation order when he killed Bayliss, but it was never enforced. If he were to get out now... He would effectively be removed in short order. He doesn't deserve to get out 
and then leave this country for what he did. Once he dies in prison, put him in a box and deport him then. Bayless says he'll send the petition to the Parole Board of Canada and the Prime Minister before the hearing in May. Kelda Yoon, CBC News, Toronto. We have a better idea where Toronto's first bricks and mortar pot shop could be located. An application has been filed with the province's Alcohol and Gaming Commission to have a retail cannabis store at 20 Cumberland Street in the heart of Yorkville. Two other applications have been filed for stores. One would be on Main Street in Brampton, the other on Lakeshore Road in St. Catharines. The commission is accepting public submissions on the locations until February 20th. The first private pot stores are set to open April 1st. With the possibility of pot legally returning to Yorkville, we dug into our archives here at the CBC. We're going to take you back to the year 1967 when Yorkville was hippie central and pot was top of mind. Yorkville is the most fantastic place. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. This is heaven. You see much evidence of uh, marijuana down here? Oh, well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Definitely. There's a hell of a lot of marijuana floating around. You think this is good? Look, marijuana hasn't been proved medically to be harmful, so why not have it? I mean, people want to take it. It's their life. That same year, CBC visited a store, a new store in Yorkville. Take a look at that. Yorkville's newest boutique. It could be a dope fiend's idea of a dream come true. Gandalf is Canada's first psychedelic attestant, or as the hippies and trippies around here call it, a headshot. Its specialties are the products designed to take along on a trip, whether the vehicle be marijuana, banana skins, or LSD. People think it's, uh, you know, an opium uh, selling place or something. It's not true at all. It's just a psychedelic shop. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, uh, what would you smoke uh, in this pipe? It looks like it's a marijuana pipe. Well, quite frankly, uh, it probably would be used by some people as a marijuana pipe. I know I wouldn't use that. I understand this is a, a supercharger? That's right, a supercharger. Yeah. What is this used for? Well, that's uh, another way of smoking marijuana. And uh, it's for uh, super smoking, you might say. Yeah, he said hippies and trippies. You can find these videos and more on our archives website. That's at cbc.ca slash archives. You may even see yourself back in the day in Yorkville. Stay with us. We'll be right back.
People have been complaining to Nick Cernkovic about the weather all day. I'm going to jump in, Nick. At one point, it felt like little pins hitting your face with I, those little pellets in the wind this morning. I know, I know. They, it, it just adds insult to injury because minus <laughs> the, the commute and everything else, you've got these little tiny drops, frozen droplets that are just hitting you in the, in the face. And that actually uh, preceded the freezing rain as it usually does. And uh, that was a, made for a pretty messy day today right across the roads. Tomorrow morning, though, again, the risk for icy conditions. Now, with that, Environment Canada has issued uh, freezing drizzle advisories across the region. These are not warnings. They're saying that while they don't meet the warning criteria, uh, there is the good chance we're going to see some patchy freezing drizzle, and I would agree with that heading through the next 24 hours. Right now, most of the freezing rain that we had tonight has pushed off. However, another wave is moving through, and there is some freezing rain in there, and also some thunderstorms at least uh, possible thunderstorms through the evening hours tomorrow. When we break it down by tomorrow morning, we're looking at patchy freezing drizzle across the region. That includes the GTA, so watch for icy road conditions through the morning hours. Also, some mist and fog in the area as, temp as uh, winds rather are going to be pretty calm through tonight. This all switches over to rainfall about 3 p.m. Prior to that, on and off freezing drizzle, freezing rainfall. Then about five, six millimeters of rainfall, winds start to pick up, temperatures briefly rise before they start falling again, and we're back into snow flurries on Friday. Right now, temperatures sitting anywhere from about zero to minus two across the Golden Horseshoe. As we move through tonight, we're going to fall to about minus three degrees. So holding more or less steady, patchy freezing drizzle across the region. Tomorrow, uh, afternoon temperatures up to about two, three degrees, but there is a chance around midnight we could hit as much as about seven or eight degrees very briefly. The winds, as I mentioned, are going to be calm through tonight, but they pick up again through tomorrow afternoon and into the evening. We're looking at wind gusts to about 70 kilometers per hour. Next five days like this, two degrees, minus two on Friday, but falling through the day. That comes in the morning. Risk for thunderstorms tomorrow, by the way, and then temperatures in the negatives through the weekend. Dwight. Thanks, Nick. You bet. If there is going to be peace and legislation, there cannot be war and investigation. The State of the Union isn't strong, but Donald Trump's words last night were, after the break, we break down the president's tone and message to his divided nation.
The U.S. president emphasized unity in his second State of the Union address. Donald Trump called for an end to the politics of revenge. But in last night's speech, he also struck a more partisan tone on a number of issues. Lindsay Duncombe has more now from Washington. There was a real ping-pong effect to this speech. At one moment, Donald Trump would be reaching out, suggesting bipartisan compromise with the Democrats. And then the next moment, it would be more hard-line rhetoric, seemingly designed to appeal to Donald Trump's base. That was especially true on the topic of immigration. The immigration section of the speech was about 15 minutes long. And there's a reason why it got so much attention. That's because of the looming deadline. By the end of next week, bipartisan negotiators have to come up with uh, a deal that would fund border security, or there are a couple of possibilities. There could be another government shutdown, or Donald Trump could declare a, a national emergency and divert funding from the military to pay for a border wall. And certainly with some of the language he was using, uh, Donald Trump appeared to be laying the groundwork for that national emergency. Here's some of what that that sounded like. The border city of El Paso, Texas, used to have extremely high rates of violent crime, one of the highest in the entire country. Immediately upon its building, with a powerful barrier in place, El Paso is one of the safest cities in our country. There might be a little bit of wiggle room here because in addition to talking to how much a wall is needed, Donald Trump described that wall as being something that would be determined in places deemed necessary by border officials. So that may mean that Trump is willing to consider a border wall that doesn't go across the entire border. In terms of those bipartisan compromises, the kinds of things that Trump talked about are really things that Democrats and and Republicans agree on. That includes paid parental leave, the idea of a new bill for infrastructure, bringing down drug prices. The problem is this speech really didn't have a lot of specifics. And when it comes to a bipartisan deal, the devil is in the details. And the Democrats who were watching this speech really didn't warm to any of those bipartisan reach outs. Here's Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer. The president was political, divisive, uh, calculating, even nasty at times. You know, you can't sit, talk about comedy and working together and give a speech that is so divisive. That just doesn't fly. So for all the bipartisan talk, bottom line, they are still squabbling in Washington. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. We've had snow, ice, and rain, so naturally, Thunderstorms are on the way, right? Next, back after the break with a final look at your forecast.
This is your Shores, your GTA picture for today. The GTA looks very different in this <laughs> shot today, but it is a nice one. Remember, get your pictures to us. Post them on Instagram. You can put them on Twitter with the hashtag show us your GTA, and we will put some of them on the show. So, rain well, in the yeah, forecast. Yeah, rain in the forecast. Middle of winter. I'm, I'm still stuck on that picture. It's a nice saying, picture, yeah, but nothing yeah, like that out no, there. No, nothing like that. Uh, yeah, we're looking at a uh, little bit of a break right now, but patchy freezing rain through tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, icy roads for tomorrow morning again. This doesn't end for the next 24 hours. It happens on and off uh, until tomorrow afternoon. Temperatures up to two degrees. And hey, you know, by the if you're up till about midnight, mm -hmm. you might actually see the temperature spike to about seven really quickly. And, and then, then it comes down again. Yeah, and then it comes down. That's just a tease if you're up that late. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, you bet. That's it for us tonight. Thank you for watching. Mike Wise has your next local news at 11. We will see you back here tomorrow at six. Have a great night, everybody.